Welcome to session uh, five of our study on faith in our first principles series. And hopefully you've been catching up with us. If you haven't, you can go back and catch all those other ones online. But this particular one is going to be faith five, the response of faith. And like I've done in every other session, I want to start off with our core scripture, which is Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. And it says, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. So you can see right there in that statement, the one that we are studying in this particular series is faith toward God. And in the previous lessons uh, on faith, we considered the development of our faith, uh, relationship with the Father, and our position of abiding in Him through faith. Uh, we also considered how our faith is developed through revelation and the renewing of our minds. One of my favorite ones was the renewing of our minds. How important is that? And in this last ses lesson, we learned what it means to believe with the heart. We talked about the difference between the mind and the heart and how actually when you study that out, they're, they're very similar in meaning. Uh, in this lesson, we're going to look at the response of faith, which includes right confession, right thinking, and right actions. Without the proper response of faith, we will never mature in our Christian walk. So let's look first at the relationship between confession and faith. Okay, we're looking at the relationship between confession and faith. And we can go right to the beginning of Scripture, right there in the garden with Adam and Eve. And if you remember, uh, when they originally sinned, they ate of the fruit that they weren't supposed to eat of, and God asked them a question. And he said this, what is this you have done? He asked Adam and Eve, what is this you have done? Now we're talking about God who knew exactly what they had done. Uh, it wasn't a surprise to him and he wasn't like trying to find out the answer. He already knew the answer. He's omniscient. He knows everything about everything. But why did he ask them, what is this that you've done in Genesis 3.13? He knew that Adam had openly and defiantly transgressed his commandment. He knew he had done exactly what he told him not to do. I believe that the reason he asked him, what is this you've done, is because he wanted him to confess. He wanted him to confess the, the sin, the transgression. Not so that he would just be guilty, but so that he could be forgiven. So that he could get back into right relationship and fellowship with his heavenly father and his creator. And so confession really started in the very beginning in the garden. And this is my first question tonight is, is confession important to the Christian life? It's a big question right there. Is confession important to the Christian life? And I'm just going to answer it real plainly. Yes, we begin our Christian life by confessing our faith. Romans 10, 8 and 10, and this will not be on the screen, but let me just read this to you and says, what, but what does it say? The word is near you. Listen to what it says. The word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now listen to how this verse finishes. For with the heart, one believes to righteousness. But it says this, but with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. 1 John uh, 1 and 9 says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, confession is, of sin is a necessary thing for forgiveness and for restoration of fellowship. But I want to tell you, Confession is also necessary for the work of faith to be released or activated in our lives. It is an activation of our faith when we confess something. I'm going to say that again just so you get it. It's an activation of our faith when we confess something. So we need to talk about that. What is confession? What is that word confession? Well, the dictionary says that to confess means to acknowledge or to own. Uh, it means to acknowledge faith in. To confess means to make confession of one's faults. But listen, it also means to make confessions of one's faith. It's not just faults. It's also confession of faith. 
The English word confess, it is actually, actually comes from a Greek word, homo logeo, which means this, to speak the same thing, to assent, to be in accord, to agree with. So it's literally coming in agreement with something else. Hebrew word translated confession is yada, which means to praise, worship, or revere with extended hands. That's what it literally means. To confess means to do this, to praise with extended hands. Now, from these definitions, which I've just given you three different uh, categories to choose from, if you want the Greek, if you want the Hebrew, or you want the English, I gave you all three. But this is the best definition that I can tell you from, the, from these biblical definitions. And it says this, it is confession is affirming something that we believe, testifying to something that we know, declaring a truth we have embraced, and celebrating truth by praising God. I'm going to read that one more time. From these biblical definitions, we can define confession as affirming something we believe, testifying to something we know, declaring a truth we have embraced, and celebrating truth by praising God. So you see, confession is a, is a big word and involves quite a few things. Our confession should always be centered around five things. The first one is this, what God in Christ has done for us in his plan of redemption. Our confession should be centered around what God in Christ has done for us in his plan of redemption. Number two is this, what God has done in us through the new birth and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So we have what, do, what God has done for us and what God has done in us. The third one is this, who we are to God the Father in Christ Jesus. We're to confess that. That should be part of our confession. The fourth thing is this, what Jesus is doing for us right now at the right hand of the Father, where he is making intercession for each one of us. And the fifth one is this, what God can do through us as we respond to him in faith. I want you to catch that. It's what he's done for us. It's what he's done in us. It's who we are in him. It's what he's doing right now. And it's what he's going to do through us. We can confess. All, there's a power in faith in confessing these things out loud. I want to tell you this. Confession is faith's way of expressing itself. We talked about what faith is. We've talked about all these different aspects of faith. But confession is faith's way of expressing itself. Did you know that faith had an expression? That's what comes out of our mouth. So here's my second question. What does our confession reveal? What does our confession reveal? Well, this is very, very simple. Our confession reveals what is in our hearts. Our confession reveals what is in our hearts. Listen to this. Luke 6.45 says it like this. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil. And with, this is the part that we quote the most. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I don't care if you want it to or not. <laughs> I don't care if you try to hold it back or not. Whatever is in your heart is going to come out of your mouth eventually. That's why I always say, you know, give me 20 minutes with somebody. Just give me long enough with them. I can figure out exactly where they're at because it's going to come out their mouth. If they start talking, I can tell you what's going on in their life. You know, recently uh, we met with someone and the first thing I asked him was, how are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm good, pastor. I'm good, pastor. Everything's great, pastor. That's awesome. We continued to talk. About 20 minutes in, he said, you know what, pastor? I'm really struggling. <laughs> So what was really in there was going to come out of his mouth eventually. It may have taken a little while. But if you're angry on the inside, it's going to come out of your mouth. If you're worried on the inside, it's going to come out of your mouth. If you're full of faith on the inside, it's going to come out your mouth. You cannot stop it. Our confession reveals what is in our heart because out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth is going to speak. Many Christians don't realize the power and the effect that their confession has upon their lives, as well as the lives of others. Did you know your confession can affect the lives of others? I know many people 
that grew up in abusive situations and even just verbally abusive in their home. And because of that, they are a shell of who they should have been because maybe a parent confessed things over them, said things over them that affected them. What we say matters. The Word of God says much about the confession of our mouth and the word of our lips. I want to just share with you uh, four different passages here real quickly in Proverbs that talk about our mouths. Proverbs 12, 14 says this, a man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. Let me read that one more time. A man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. Your mouth is producing some fruit. The Bible says that you can, it can satisfy you. What's coming out of your mouth can satisfy you with good things. This is another verse. It says, Proverbs 13, 3, he who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. I don't know. The Bible talks about having a guard over your mind, a guard over your ears. You've got to have a guard over your mouth as well because it's important what's coming out of your mouth. Proverbs 18, 21 says this, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. Fruit. It says both ways. You have the power to, to proclaim or confess death out of your mouth and you have the power to confess life out of your mouth and your life will reap the fruit of whatever your confession is saying. Because listen, Whatever's in your heart is going to come out of your mouth. Whatever is in your heart is what is coming through the eye gate of your soul, through your, through your eyes, through your ears. It's what's that battlefield of the mind that we talked about. That's what shapes who your heart is or what your heart is or what's in your heart. And whatever is in your heart is going to come out of your mouth. That's why all of these things work together to shape our faith. Our confession is faith's way of expressing itself. I'm going to say that again. So whoever guards his mouth, Proverbs 21, 23, and his tongue keeps his soul from troubles. I'm trying to help myself tonight. I'm trying to help everybody here, everybody that's listening online. I'm trying to keep you from some trouble. The way we do that is we guard our mouth and our lips. There's an old saying that says what? Loose lips sink ships. Why do they say that? Because people that just shoot off at the mouth, you know, there's all kinds of troubles that come their way. I've seen people say things in situations that if they would have just shut their mouth, they wouldn't have got punched in the nose. But they couldn't do it. They wouldn't have got in that fight. They wouldn't have got in that. They wouldn't have got arrested. They wouldn't have got thrown in jail. They wouldn't have. All kinds of things happen. I know marriages that, that sink, literally. The ship of their marriage sinks because one of them cannot control their tongue. They say evil things. They say anything that comes to their mind. They say hurtful things. They destroy each other. I know marriages that both of them, they're just like, literally, it's like they're throwing missiles at each other out their mouth all the time and wonder why they have so many problems. Listen, if you will guard your mouth and guard your lips, it will keep you from problems. There's sometimes it's just best not to say anything. I, I learned this when I was young. It's better to be silent and be thought a fool than to speak up and remove all doubt. <laughs> and, and because of that, a lot of people, you will think they're foolish because they speak all the time. And then there's somebody in the corner of the room that never says anything. Now, he might be a fool, but you just don't know it because he's not telling you he's a fool. What comes out your mouth matters. Mark 12, 11, 22 through 24 says this. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. I want to I show you this in here. It says, have faith in God for assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, whoever says to this mountain, that's out of your mouth. Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will come to pass, he will have Whatever he, shouldn't it be believes? It's not what he believes though. It's what, he it says it's what he says. There's a power in your confession. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask, that's coming out your mouth, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. 
So in the word of God, we find that our faith in God is revealed and released by the way we talk. It's not enough just to believe. It is what we believe and what we speak that produces actions. Look, Jesus, who is our example, always spoke in faith. He always spoke in faith. Listen to this. He spoke to the sea and it immediately calmed. He spoke to a corpse and it came back to life instantly. He spoke to a tree and it withered. So powerful and productive were the words of Jesus that Peter declared this, you have the words of eternal life. He said, what you say has power in them, Jesus. But guess what? That same power is living on the inside of us. And that same power of life and death is on the inside of us. So the things that we confess have life in them. They also have death in them. But what we want to do is we want to have faith confessions. We want to have things, we want to say what God says. See, we have to confess a positive confession. Some people uh, confuse positive confession with denial, though. I've, I've grown up in, in this from time to time where, you know, people just won't even say the truth. They'll be hacking up a lung and saying, I'm not sick. And I'm like, well, <laughs> your body's telling me something different. It's not this denial. It's not this uh, uh, saying, I don't have a cold. When you do have a cold and a cough and a runny nose and a fever, what it's saying is not the opposite of the truth or denial of the truth. When we say a positive confession, what we're going to confess is that he is our healer. That he, by his stripes, we are healed. That's our confession. We're confessing what God says about us. We're confessing his words. It's not that we are, are, are you know, in denial about being sick, but we confess that he is our healer, that he is Jehovah Rapha, that he is uh, uh, the God who heals all of our sicknesses and all of our disease. And by his stripes, we are healed. And that is a positive confession that each and every one of us can do every day. There are also some wrong types of confession that we can have. James uh, 3 and verse 6 says this, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. And the tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. It says a lot in that little, that little verse right there, that the tongue, the power of the tongue. What does it say? There's several bad results uh, that can happen from our tongues. Number one, it says it defiles the whole body. There are many Christians who stay sick or sick uh, because they're constantly poisoning their body with wrong confession. You know, I, I, I hear people say stuff that I, I hate it when I hear it. You know, I hear people say stuff like, well, I'm probably going to die like my dad did. Well, I'm probably going to, you know, I'll probably die early, you know, or I'll see you in hell. I mean, stuff like that. I'm like, why would you say that? You know, why would you confess that over your life? Because this is what it says. You're defiling your whole body. I know people that, that confess things so much that they believe it and their life will end up doing exactly what they confessed. They'll end up sick. They'll end up broke. They'll end up divorced. They'll end up out on the streets. But they've said it for many years. Oh, my, my, my mom and dad couldn't stay together. I probably won't stay together either. My dad died at a young age. I'm probably going to die of a heart attack too. I've heard people say that. I'm like, oh, don't confess those things over your life. Have faith confessions. What, is, what does faith say about your life? It says, by humility and the fear of the Lord come riches, honor, and long life. I choose that confession. That's what I'm going to do right there. I mean, think about it. What is everybody in life they pursue? Riches. They want to be honored. They want people to, to respect them and and appreciate them, and you want to live a long life. If you're having riches and honor, you want to live a long life. And the Bible tells us in, in Proverbs that it's by humility and the fear of the Lord that we get those things. So I want to confess that. If I want to confess anything, I want to, I want to confess that, God, I want to be humble before you. God, I want to respect and fear you. That's going to be my confession. 
And even this week, you know, it's not, it's not a weakness to, con- to confess things that you need. I asked the Holy Spirit this week. He gave me seven things as I was praying this week. A confession every day. Holy Spirit, help me do this. That's not a confession that I'm weak. That's a confession that you are strong enough to help me with this. You know, what does he say? In my weakness, his strength is made perfect. It doesn't mean that you're not going to be weak. There are areas in every one of our life where we are weaker. And, you know, you may be strong in one minute. You may be strong. But we all have weaknesses too. It's not a denial of the weakness, but it is saying in faith, in my weakness, your strength is made perfect. So I'm going to confess that your strength is perfect for me no matter what I go through. I want to have that kind of confession of faith. It, it says right here, though, it defiles the whole body. The second thing it says is it sets on fire the course of nature. The course of nature. Which we don't talk like that these days. But literally, it's the flow of, of life. Our lives have a flow. Our lives have a destiny, a purpose, a meaning. And there's things that God has called us to do. And, and when we begin to let our lips and our tongue say things and do things, what it does is it stops the flow. It stops the plan of God in our lives. I know many people that don't accomplish what God called them to do simply because of their confession. I mean, I know people that say, well, I could never do that. I, I could never witness to someone. Why? Who told you that? You can witness to anybody, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. That's my scripture. I'm going to confess that. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because this is the power of God unto salvation. See, we've got scriptures. We've got promises. Those are our faith confections. We don't have to walk in fear. We can walk in faith. Amen? And when we say things out of our mouth that are not filled with faith, it sets on fire the course of nature. And then the last thing it says is it's set on fire by hell. The Bible says that our tongue, literally our confession, if we're not careful, can have its very roots in Satan. It can be coming straight from the pit of hell. There's some things that come out of our mouth that you need to recognize. That is straight from the pit of hell. That is not God. That is Satan trying to mess your life up. Sometimes it's just responses to other people. I know people that, you know, or I don't know these people, but I've heard stories of people that have gotten into altercations and wound up dead just because of something they said. You think that was God's plan or the enemy's plan for their life? That's the enemy's plan because God had a better plan for them. So I just want us to be careful and that the fact that our tongues are so powerful, but we do not have to live under the control of our tongues. We can control what we say by lining our confession up with the word of God. If the tongue is brought under the power of the Holy Spirit, then the whole body can be bridled. I want to talk to you about what right confession is. Right confession is this. Real faith in God simply says about what oneself what the word says. If God says that by his stripes we are healed, in 1 Peter 2, 24, then we are healed. Can we say amen to that? If his word says that the Lord is the strength of my life in Psalms 27, 1, then he is. If God says that we can do all things through Christ, then we can. That's Philippians 4.13. And if he says he cares for us, he does. We have what the word says we have. That's the beautiful thing about faith confession. We have what the word says we have, and we are who the word says we are. Amen? Hebrews 4.14 says this, Seeing then that we have a great high priest, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, catch this last part, let us hold fast our confession. He's saying, don't lose it. Don't just let anything come out of your mouth. Hold fast, hold on to it. Hold on to what I've given you. Jesus didn't come here for nothing. He didn't come here so we could be weak. He didn't come here so we could be overcome. He said, I've come to give you life and I've come to give you life more abundantly. I didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that through me, the world might be saved. He said, I loved you so much. I gave my only begotten son. Don't lose that. I cared for you so much that I gave the most valuable thing that I could ever give so that you could have a faith-filled life full of love, full of victory, full of strength. Amen? 
So hold fast to that confession. Don't let the enemy steal your confession. Don't let the enemy make you believe that you are less than what God says you are. Amen? The Greek word for confession simply means this, to say the same thing. It simply means to agree with God. How powerful is that? We have the ability through our confession to literally come into agreement with God. That's powerful. This type of confession is going to lead to a lot of good things in your life. I promise you. It says that your life will produce, your, or your mouth will produce fruit. How many want good fruit in your life? You want some good God things happen in your life that are literally following the confession. Your life will follow your strongest confession. That's the truth. So here's my third question though. Is it possible, if there's good works in our life, is it possible to be saved by good works? Is it possible to be saved by good works? The answer to that is absolutely not. We are saved by grace through faith, not by works. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But this leads me to my next question, question number four. If works do not save us, do they have any place in our lives? We, we, we've established that we can't be saved by works. So what good do works have in our lives? Well, the Bible says this, that faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. James 2.17 says, Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. James 2, 14 through 17 says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace and be warmed and filled. We're filming this on, it's just gotten cold outside. So if, you, if somebody was cold and you just said to them, well, depart in peace and, and be warm and be filled. Would that do anything for them? No. It says this, but you don't give them the things which are needed for their body. What does it profit them? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Listen, faith is not, we're not saved by works, but we are saved for works. We're not saved by works, but we are saved for works. Ephesians 2.10 says this, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Titus 3.8 says this, This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. Listen, he said, if you're believing, if you have faith, if you're filled with faith, then he said, there's some good works that have been prepared for you beforehand that you're supposed to be walking in. We should be the, the we should have all kinds of things happening in our lives because we're filled with faith. We're, we've got a faith confession. We're doing the will of the Father. We're doing what he's called us to do. Not because we want recognition, but because we want to give him glory. Our lives want to, want to shine a light on Jesus and say, look what he's done for us. How could I not? How could I not do whatever he calls me to do? My life is, is laid down in service to him. The scripture gives us several reasons for the importance and the purpose of maintaining good works in our lives. And so I close with this. By good works, Matthew 5, 16, it says, God is glorified. That's why we do good works, so that God will get the glory. In 1 Peter 2, 12, it says, by good works, the mouths of those who speak against us are closed. I'm convinced that even right now the church has a bad reputation because the church is the church only in name, not in deed. I guarantee you if the church went out and started feeding all the poor and clothing all those that were cold and, and doing all the works, then people would just say, I love the church. The church is amazing. But sometimes our lives, our lives don't match our, uh, what we say. It's called hypocrisy. We say one thing, but then when we leave, we don't do what we say. So works are the doing of what we are saying. So if you say you're a Christian, if you say you're a believer, if you say you love God, if you say you love people, the Bible tells us there's two things that everything hangs on. Love the Lord God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. If we get those two things wrong, 
can we really call ourselves believers? I don't care what we say. If we're not doing the works, if we're not actually doing what God's called us to do, then we're not actually being his hands and feet in this world, amen? And what happens when we do the good works is it closes the mouth of those people that want to speak against us. That's what it does. It's hard to speak against somebody that's doing a lot of good stuff. It just is. Well, I don't like that guy. Why? Well, I don't know why I don't like him. He's actually doing a lot of good. That's what good works do for us. And then the last one is this. By good works, we evidence the genuineness of our profession of faith. Exactly what I said. We have a profession of faith, a confession that we are God's child, that we have been saved, that we have been redeemed, that we're not that old person. What does it do? It is the evidence. Works are the evidence. If you don't have any works in your life, I'm, I'm worried. If, there, if you're not doing some good for some people, I'm worried. Because he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them, healing them, setting them free. The early church in Acts, what did they do? They sold all, everything that they had. They came together. They, they loved each other. They, they just ministered to each other. They went and they, the Bible says they turned the world upside down. That's what, that's what happens when you get Jesus. That's, the good, that's what good works. What do we need right now in America? We need our world turned upside down for the gospel, for Jesus' glory, so that, so that they can say, man, there are people that actually believe in Jesus and they do the works that they've been called to do. Spiritual faith is based on a love relationship with the word of God, Jesus, and it will enable us to walk as he walks. Walking and confessing this faith will result in maturity and we will begin to do the works of Jesus. Nothing brings more honor to Jesus than those who bear his name and are found living as he lived. It's pretty powerful. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today, God. Lord, even as I'm praying right now, Lord, I just repent for the areas in my life where I've let my mouth say things that it shouldn't have said, where I've let my mouth be out of control. And God, I just ask you, Lord, remind me, Holy Spirit, of the times when I just need to be silent or the times when I need to say something loving instead of something judgmental or something cutting. And Lord, I just pray that as I do this, Lord, there will be fruit that is produced in my life, Lord, that I will live off of that fruit and that, God, there will be works that follow because of the confession of faith that I have. Father, I pray that other people would begin to see not just what I say, but, Lord, what I do. And Lord, I pray that for everyone else that's here that's listening to this. In Jesus' name, help us to live a life of faith. Amen.